I don't know about you, but I always find afternoon lectures more challenging than morning ones. <laughs> Just giving yourself the full belly and <laughs> a chance to come and relax and enjoy yourselves and now you've got to come back and listen to me for a little bit more. But, um, let's pick it up from where we kind of left off and we're looking at some of the different reasons for why Jonah had gone to Nineveh. The third one is where we finished. Uh, he was drawn by Tarshish. The fourth possible reason is that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. This is actually the explicit reason that is given in chapter 1 for why Jonah travels to Tarshish. That is that he is fleeing from the presence of the Lord. It's actually a claim that's re repeated a couple of times in that first chapter. Let's have a look at verse 3. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Oh, sorry. So yeah, Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Oh, I mean, chapter 3. <laughs> that would explain why it's just not making sense. <laughs> why is he going to Nineveh? He's not meant to be going to Nineveh. Okay, so it's in chapter 1 in verse 3. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. And it's also picked up then again in verse 10 as well. Why does he go to Tarshish? One of the reasons is he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. In this context, a text like Isaiah chapter 66 verse 19 is quite interesting. Isaiah 66 verse 19. Why does he go um, to Tarshish? For I know their works and their thoughts, and I am coming to gather all nations and tongues. And they shall come and see my glory. And I will send, set aside among them. From them I will send survivors to the nations. To Tarshish, Put and Lut, which draw the bow. To Tubal and Javan. To the coastlands far away that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. Mm -hmm. And they shall declare my glory among the nations. So the Lord there is... Speaking, and he's describing a number of locations, including Tarshish, Kut and Lud, as places which have not heard of my fame or have seen my glory. So why does Jonah flee to Tarshish? Well, Tarshish is one of those faraway locations. It's a place where the Lord is not known. He wants to flee from the presence of the Lord. Do we sometimes want to flee to a place where the Lord is not known? Jonah wants to flee Israel. He wants to leave behind his home country. He wants to go elsewhere. Do we sometimes want to escape from the people of God? A consistent pattern that we see throughout the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that the main source of opposition to God's ministers God's prophets, does not actually come from outside of the people. It actually comes from within. For the most part, the true prophets are rejected and persecuted by Israel's kings. Jesus is rejected and persecuted by the Jewish authorities. The main source of opposition to prophets and pastors often comes from within the people of God, not without. Is this your experience as pastor? Have you been bruised and hurt by those within the community of faith, perhaps more than those outside the community? If so, take comfort, because it may well mean that you're doing a good job, <laughs> because it's certainly the biblical precedent. It's the false prophets who get off lightly in the Bible, they're the ones who are eating at the king's table, having banquets and enjoying life. It's the true prophets who are persecuted. 
And so Jonah flees. Let me just open back to Jonah. Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. This leads into my final point. The cost that Jonah pays to flee from God's call. I talked earlier on about the distance that it was from Joppa in Israel to um, Tarshish. I said a distance of approximately three and a half, four thousand kilometres. A trek that may have taken as long as a year. This means that when Jonah paid his fare to travel to Tarshish, he would have parted with a considerable sum of money. And there is actually some indication in the text that he was paying for more than just his own personal fare. This doesn't come through clearly in the English. In verse 3, it says, He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So he paid his fare. In Hebrew, however, a feminine pronoun is used instead. He paid, if we want to do a literal translation, he paid her fare. <coughs> so then you need to ask if you've got a feminine pronoun, what's the antecedent for that pronoun? What is it referring back to? The immediately preceding feminine now is the ship. Okay? So he paid her fare, he paid her hire. He hired out the ship. What does that suggest in terms of what he paid? A lot more money. <laughs> he's not just buying his own fare to flee to Tarshish. He's actually hired out the boat, everything, all the berths, all the crew, to take him to Tarshish. Ancient Jewish tradition suggests that because Jonah was in such a hurry to escape from God's call, he hired the whole ship rather than simply paying for his seat. And this cost Jonah 4,000 gold denarii. Um, and I did a quick conversion of it. It comes to a little over $900,000 in today's money. So the attempted flight must have cost Jonah a great deal of money, 900000 it cost him a great two deal of time, or it would have cost him a great deal of time, a year's journey. It almost costs him his life when he gets taken in the storm. And I think there is something interesting here in the price that we are willing to pay sometimes to flee God's call. What cost, what price do we pay, or might we be willing to pay, to run from God's call? to finance our own self-will, to build our own kingdoms. And there's an interesting quote from Youngblood. The great fish that Yahweh graciously provided for Jonah's transportation is parallel to the ship that Jonah paid for out of his own pocket. The ship carried Jonah close to his grave, while the fish carried Jonah back to dry land and life. Those things that we purchase and we spend our resources and we commit our time and money and effort sometimes lead to death. But it's what God graciously provides free of charge that will lead to life and to fullness. And so the fourth reason he flees from the presence of the Lord is that that is a costly thing to you commits significant resources and time to do it. I was going to get you just to kind of spend some time in your own thinking about these four dynamics I've talked about and whether you've seen them potentially in your own ministry or 
what price, what cost sometimes have you considered paying to escape from God's call? But we've kind of run out of time for that. What I do think, though, is interesting is that I've been drawing a connection between Jonah and Christian ministers and saying that the experiences of Jonah perhaps in some way, par some way parallel our own experiences. But the other thing to do is to consider the parallel between not just Jonah and Christian ministers, but Jonah and the churches that we lead as well. And that sometimes our churches, our congregations themselves may be antagonistic towards God's call. They may be scared of God's call. They may be intimidated by God's call. They may be drawn and attracted by the temptation of Tarshish as well. So Jonah sets up interesting parallels, not just that I think we need to consider as individuals and challenges we may face as individuals, but also I think raises interesting parallels in terms of the churches that we lead as well. How are our churches drawn by or attracted by certain temptations? Or how are our churches um, scared of the call that God has placed before them as communities? Just another dimension that I think the book may challenge. Okay. That's the first three verses of the book. We're probably going to need to move a little bit quicker to get through the rest in the time that we've got before us. Um, for this second lecture, what we are going to do is we are going to jump a bit more and we're going to work all the way through to uh, chapter 3, verse 2. So 1, verse 4, through to 3, verse 2. What that you see is that this section divides up quite nicely in terms of three different environments that Jonah encounters. The first, we see Jonah in the storm, which is kind of the rest of chapter 1. We then have Jonah in the fish, which is the end of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. And then finally, the final environment is Jonah on the beach, which is the end of chapter 2 and the start of chapter 3. And I just want to spend a bit of time looking at Okay, so Jonah in the storm. The Lord responds to Jonah's desire to flee to Tarshish by hurling a great wind upon the sea, such a mighty storm that the ship threatened to break up. This is a display of divine power, but it's a display of divine power with a purpose. Its purpose is to stop Jonah in his tracks. The Lord's stopping the ship moving forward. He's made, stopping it making headway to Tarshish. He sends a storm to stop Jonah in his tracks. Now storms, understood metaphorically, are of course part and parcel of every Christian's lives, including the lives of pastoral leaders. And we're kind of, I guess, grappling with some of those stories about storms and challenges that various people are facing at the moment. <coughs> and we can label a wide variety of experiences as storms. So we might talk about job loss, we might talk about sickness, we might want to talk about, well, as we've heard this morning, death, financial difficulties, family difficulties, lots of things <coughs> get labelled as storms. Now, I'm not convinced that this passage necessarily speaks to each and every one of these issues, okay? In this passage, the storm is set within a specific context and it comes for a specific purpose. Okay? It's an adverse situation which is placed before the prophet to get the prophet back on track. Okay? And so what I think we need to be careful is that we need to be careful of generalising from Jonah's experience with the storm here to suggest that that's going to be somehow universal or that that's going to be what it's like when we encounter a storm in our lives. Okay. As if what happens here might suddenly shed light on all the storm experiences that we're going to face. The reason I say that is because narratives, and we're dealing with a narrative here, are essentially descriptive and not prescriptive. Okay? 
They're simply telling us what took place, what occurred in Jonah's life. And I think we need to be careful of taking what is descriptive and turning that into a normative kind of expectation as in terms of this is how things are always going to be. When I'm talking with my students, the illustration I use for this is in terms of Moses' experience with the burning bush. Okay? Um, God speaks wonderfully, powerfully to Moses at that particular time, at that particular place, using that particular method. But we've got to be careful of extrapolating from that narrative to think that that's the normal way that God communicates with his people. Um, it may have been true for Moses, that may have been the way that God spoke, but I think we've got to be careful of saying that that's somehow normative, or that's the expectation. Um, it may well be. God may well have spoken to you in such a dynamic and powerful way, but um, for many that is not the case. So I think we need to be careful of, of saying that this is the story, this would happen, and we can learn this about it. Um, because what happens here isn't necessarily going to apply in each and every context. And so one of the things that I'd, I'd say here is that in this context, the storm is sent by God. Okay, it's, we hear about that. It's explicit in the text. But that doesn't mean that I think that we can extrapolate from that that every storm that we encounter in life is something that is sent from God. That we're dealing with a descript description of what took place at that time in that context. Nevertheless, as I was working through this storm narrative, three elements clearly stood out to me. And they may be significant for our time together. The first one, as I said before, in this passage, not in all cases, but in this passage, the storm's origin is the work of the Lord himself. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. The Lord is responsible. The Lord hurls a great wind upon the sea. This narrative suggests that Yahweh does not easily give up on his purposes for his people. He is intent on having his commission fulfilled. And he will not let Jonah escape <coughs> his role without a fight. And so the Lord sends a storm. The biblical text suggests that it's not uncommon for people to try to avoid the calling the Lord has placed on their lives. Can we think of any examples where people try to avoid it, get around it, make objections to it? Moses. Isaiah. Isaiah is perhaps a little bit, he actually goes with it. He's probably the exception that proves the rule. Jeremiah, though. Um, Gideon in the book of Judges. Uh, and Jonah here, just to name a few. All of these people object to or question the Lord's choice of them. This seems, in fact, to be a perfectly natural response when you're confronted by the divine word. The, the initial response is to be hesitant about it. And yet, in each instance, the Lord does not let them get away. In the case of Moses and Jeremiah, he convincingly answers each of their objections. In the case of Gideon, he provides the sign of the fleece. In the case of Jonah, he sends a storm. And so people who are called, us, you, me, may try to run from Yahweh. We may flee in the opposite direction. Don't think that the Lord will necessarily give in without a fight. A lot of commentators at this point talk about the irresistibility of God's call. That once God has placed a call in the lives of his people, there is nothing that we can do um, we will eventually have to follow through on. Um, certainly if we look at the biblical text, there is a sense in which often the prophetic word is irresistible, but once it's given, the prophet has to speak it. I'm a bit of a cynic, though, when it comes to this whole notion of the irresistibility of God's call. Um, I've got a sense, um, this isn't really based on any significant biblical experience <laughs> Jesus, but just more that it is possible to resist God's call. Um, the reason, though, we don't read about it in the Bible, though, is because we don't hear about those stories in the Bible 
Um, if someone successfully resisted God's call, their story isn't told. We only hear about the stories, um, we only hear the stories of people who didn't resist God's call. Um, I don't think I'll go down that, that line too much. It's, just, <laughs> but it, it's an interesting thought. God will place a call on your life and he will be serious about it. He will pursue you because he wants that call to come about. But does he pursue you to the extent that it's irresistible or you don't have a choice? I don't know. Jonah simply tells us that God takes the call seriously and God is going to pursue it. He's going to kill Moses. He's going to kill Moses? Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> what about Israel's vocation and their ability generation after generation to resist it? To resist it, yeah, yeah. Within a generation. Pardon? You know, within each generation, yeah, yeah. they had the choice to, to serve or not serve. Yes, yeah. So they resisted what should have been resistible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the part of that thing for the Yeah. Back me up with your son. Okay, if it backs up with what I'm saying, then yes, you're wrong. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Um, so Yahweh is serious about the call that he places, and <laughs> the Lord does expect his people to follow through, but that doesn't mean we can't flee in the other direction. So, in the passage, the storm's origins is the work of the Lord himself, showing that the Lord wants his call to come about. The second thing in this passage is that the storm threatens the boat. When God works to bring Jonah back on track, he doesn't directly target Jonah himself. Okay? So Jonah is the indirect target of the storm. What is the direct target of the storm? The boat, the ship. The thing which is directly impacted by the storm activity is a ship. Read through verse 4. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. The storm attacks the ship. Put it another way, the Lord doesn't send an illness on Jonah, something like seasickness that forces him to know, turn around and go back, whatever it may be. He sends a storm which affects the boat. And so in order to bring people back on track, the Lord may target those things in which we have placed our trust. The boat was meant to be the means of Jonah escaping God's will. It was his means of fleeing from Joppa and travelling to Nineveh. But Yahweh is working to remove that option. The boat will not help Jonah. And so what are the things that we have ended up putting our trust in? What are the things that we have invested in in order to escape from the Lord's call? Those things may well be at risk. The third thing about the storm here. The storm helps clarify identities. Storm experiences are often challenging. I wrote that comment and then I wrote to myself, that's actually why they're called storm experiences. <laughs> storm experiences are often challenging. Okay? They're often uncomfortable. But a potential benefit of storm experiences is that they help us to get a greater clarity around identity. We can emerge from these experiences with a better picture of who we are. Perhaps we also emerge from these experiences with a better picture of who God is. Now, storm narratives in the Bible are not that common. Anyone tell me where the next one is? We've actually talked about it already, one of the stupid sayings of Jesus. <laughs> the next storm narrative we encounter is? Matthew. Matthew, that's right, in the Gospels. Okay. Story of Jesus calming the storm. Young blood, commentator up there, has identified seven parallels between the story of Jonah and the Matthean account of the calming of the storm. Got them up there. They escape by sailing the opposite. They try to escape by sailing the opposite direction. There is a violent windstorm on the sea. There's imminent danger of ship sinking. 
a deep sleep stood uh, during the storm, rude awakened by frightened shipmates, can't be deceived by the curtain's action, and the shipmates are all struck fear at the divine power. To me, this suggests that Matthew has composed his way, his story, in a way that deliberately evokes the story of Jonah. And that he potentially wants his audience to read his story in the light of Jonah. A key parallel which stands out between these two stories is the focus on identity and calling which emerge. If we look in Jonah chapter 1, um, the storm strikes, Jonah has been down in the belly of the ship, he comes out. And the sailors cast lots to determine who is to blame for the storm. Verse 7. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. They then go on to ask him a series of questions. <coughs> what is your occupation? Where did you come from? What is your country? And of who people are, and of what people are you? Those four is it, questions revolve around two key ideas or relate to two key things. What do they relate to? Jonah's sorry his his ethnicity, right? his ethnicity, okay, so his identity. Okay, who is this? Who are you? You know, so that's one of the series of questions. Um, where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So it's questions about what is your identity? Who are you? What's the other question relate to? What is your occupation? occupation? What's your vocation? Questions associated with identity. Questions associated with vocation. What is your occupation? So in the midst of the raging storm, Jonah is forced to reflect on these two things. Issues of vocation, issues of identity. Now, if we turn to Matthew 8, a great storm has whipped up. The disciples wake Jesus and they beg him to save their lives. Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea and there is a dead calm. What then do the disciples do? What does this prompt the disciples to do? Matthew 8. How does the narrative conclude? They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey? What has this storm experienced forced the disciples to do? Reflecting on the identity. Who is this Jesus that even the winds and the sea obey? It prompts them to reassess their understanding of who this Jesus is and what his mission might be. And so this, to me, is one of the main consequences of the storm experiences that we may encounter. They will force us to reflect on who we are. They force us to reflect on what we are doing. But they also can force us to reflect on who God is, who this God is whom we worship. <coughs> so the next environment Jonah experiences is in the belly of the fish. So eventually Jonah is picked up by the sailors, he's manhandled and thrown into the sea. Let me just read the text. <laughs> then they said to him, what shall we do to you for the sea may quiet down for us? Sorry, that the sea may quiet down for us. For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. 
Nevertheless, <coughs> the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased for you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its rage. And as Jonah is sinking to the bottom of the sea, the Lord sends a large fish to swallow him up. And he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and while he is there, he utters a prayer, a prayer which has strong parallels with a number of prayers that we find in the book of Psalms. Now, in our lives, we're often very conscious of the storm experiences that we encounter. But are we as aware of the belly of the fish experiences? I was trying to come up with a good way of saying that. Storm experiences sounds so catchy, but belly of the fish experiences. Peterson likens Jonah's time in the belly of the fish to an experience of what he refers to as ascesis, A-S-K-E-S-I-S. Ascesis can be defined as a practice of severe self-discipline or asceticism for spiritual reasons. So ascesis is where we get the word ascetic from. He sees in this experience a period of self-discipline self a period of limitation, a time of confinement. And he notes that these are often important factors in periods of spiritual growth, spiritual development, and spiritual maturity. Self-discipline, uh, limitation, times of confinement. I'm glad you began with your little spill then, James, because this... Uh, why else do we send people to uh, Easter camps, or young people to Easter camps? and subject them to sleep deprivation and freezing dormitories unless we recognise the value of this kind of thing. Okay. Periods of confinement, periods of limitation, periods of self-discipline are actually really fundamental in periods of growth and development. Uh, pardon? Leadership <laughs> Now, when I talk about the experience of Easter camps, I'm a little bit joking, but I'm also a little bit serious. We've recognised the value of these kind of experiences for young people. A period of time, uh, of limitation. Not literal confinement, at least I hope you're not really enjoying <laughs> confining them. But that restriction and that self-discipline. Lots of tremendous work, lots of spiritual and creative energy is released during periods of confinement whether that is self-imposed or otherwise. Some of the best passages of the New Testament were written by Paul when he's in prison. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, which contains his famous line, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, while he was in, kind of the name gives it away, Birmingham jail. <laughs> Jonah composes his great psalm while he is in the belly of the fish. Now, in the case of Jonah, his experience of ascesis, his experience of confinement, is involuntary. He doesn't have a choice in the matter. He's cast over the, ship, over the side of the ship and he's swallowed up um, into a time of prayer and worship. But perhaps this is something we should consider about cultivating, about constructing, about developing. Being in the belly of the fish, having a time of self-discipline, a time of limitation, a time of confinement, can be a good thing. So how do we go about constructing an escasis? In the ordinary course of things, you're not going to be able to go down to the beach, jump in the water and get swallowed by a fish into a time of prayer and solitude. <coughs> we have to find our own place. We have to carve out our own time. Here I think there are four key factors that we might need to consider. 
Um, time is going to be a key element. Peterson in particular talks about the value of having a regular asthesis, a regular period of self-discipline and limitation and confinement. But I also think there's a lot of value in those one-off, pivotal, life-changing experiences that we sometimes go through, about the value of uh, church camps, of church gatherings, of pastoral retreats, of the McGarry lectures when they're done by someone who's half decent. <laughs> so in those other years, in other words. <laughs> um, but having a time that we know that we can set aside for these things, a place, a ministry context. You know, how does this actually fit within my ministry situation? Um, an asthesis which is targeted to our situation, how we're travelling spiritually, and what may not or may not be appropriate given our current situation. If we take these things seriously, a time, a place, a ministry context, the first, if we have these on board, we quickly realise that there is no such thing as a one size fits all approach to ascesis. Okay? This is going to be as individual and as unique as you are. That's a famous quote. There are no details among souls. Okay. And so there is no one size fits all um, ascesis. Furthermore, there is no one size fits all time. There's no one size fits all. There's no one size fits all time answer as well. This is something we need to be willing to grow and to change and develop and perhaps even discard as we ourselves grow and develop and change. None of this, of course, guarantees change. None of these acts of limitation, <laughs> confinement, self-discipline automatically produce a deepened and more authentic life. There's no reason to think that a young person going along to an Easter camp will automatically emerge out of that differently. It's not a mechanical process that we simply plug in and the results happen at the end. If you look at the book of Jonah, Jonah on Chapter 3 and 4 isn't really greatly different from Jonah in chapter 1 and 2. There is nothing to suggest that Jonah himself has undergone a tremendous or a radical shift or change in his orientation. There is nothing to suggest that the belly of the fish experience has left him as a changed man. He does comply, but inwardly, his attitude towards the mission, I think, remains fundamentally unchanged. So these kinds of things, this time of species does not guarantee change. But I do think it provides the conditions which make change possible. It opens us up. It makes it possible where it perhaps wasn't possible before, even though it doesn't guarantee it. So after praying in the belly of the fish, <coughs> the Lord speaks to the fish and it literally vomits. You've got to get that in your mind, that picture. Vomits Jonah out onto dry land. And so I hope when you read that text, you've actually got a picture of Jonah kind of emerging, covered in half-digested fish food and mucus, kind of straggling up the beach after being ejected out of the fish's mouth. If not, you're probably missing something of what the author is trying to say. And so we have Jonah is in front of his third environment. Jonah on the beach. When you read through Jonah carefully, you hopefully notice that the first two verses of chapter 3 actually match quite closely the first two verses of chapter 1. In both we find the same word formula beginning. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Key difference between those two passages is the element that comes after Jonah's name. In chapter 1, we're given more details about Jonah's identity, who he is. Who is this Jonah? He is the son of Amittai. In chapter 3, we're given some more details about the nature of the word that he is going to pay. 
how to pronounce, that this is the second time he has received this word. This is the second word. So God gives Jonah a second chance to fulfill his commission. Jonah may have turned his back on God. He may have fled in the opposite direction. We've seen he's travelling, trying to travel west rather than east. Jonah may have hardened his heart and said no. But God has not <coughs> turned his back on Jonah. He gives Jonah a second chance. And Jonah, of course, is not the only person whom God gives a second chance to. The best example I can think of comes from the New Testament, and it's the person Peter. Peter was a fisherman from Galilee, and he was called by Jesus, along with his brother Andrew, as one of the first disciples. Peter seems to have constantly accompanied Jesus as he travelled throughout Israel proclaiming the good news. He was even present at the Transfiguration. Perhaps no one knew Jesus better than Peter. Yet on the night before Jesus' crucifixion, what happens with Peter? Denies Jesus three times, turns his back on him and walks away. <coughs> the amazing, wonderful news, however, is that this is not the end of Peter's story. After Jesus is resurrected, he appears to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. What's he doing, do we know? He's cooking fish, that's right, he's making the breakfast. And after they've finished eating, he addresses Peter and he gives him a leadership position amongst the disciples. We've got in the Gospel of John, um, chapter 21. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter may have turned his back on Jesus. He may have denied Jesus three times. He may have gone his own way. But Jesus does not turn his back on Peter. Jesus gives him a second chance. Now there's something interesting about Peter's name probably aware that Peter actually had a double name. His birth name was Simon. Simon, and he was named Peter, that's right, by Jesus. What you may not be aware of, although it was in that passage, was the name of his father. What did, it, what did the text say there? John. Son of John, yeah. Okay, so his father's name was John. In this context, Matthew 16, verse 17, is quite interesting. Context. Jesus has just come into the district of Caesarea Philippi. His popularity is growing. And he asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they give various replies, John the Baptist, Elijah, maybe one of the prophets. Then Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Peter correctly answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. To which Jesus replies in verse 17, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Now what's happening here, I think, is that on one level, Jesus has constructed a word play. Okay. Jonah, John. They sound similar in English. They sound similar in Greek as well. 
So on one level, we're dealing with a wordplay. But perhaps he's also making a more profound point. Perhaps he knows the kind of person Peter is. Perhaps he knows that he's a little bit like the prophet from the Old Testament. Perhaps he knows that Peter might turn his back on Jesus, even though Jesus knows he might turn his back on him. Therefore, Jesus refers to Peter as son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. The good news of the first two verses of Jonah 3 is that even though we all may be sons and daughters of Jonah in our own way, we all may flee our call, we all may try to travel in our own directions, we all may try to pay tremendous costs to avoid what God is asking us. God doesn't turn his back on us. The God we worship is a God of second chances. So, how are you a son or daughter of Jonah? How has God given you a second chance? At the same time, I think we need to be careful of pushing this theology too far. That we end up turning a God of second chances into a God of endless chances. Okay? And we take God's willingness to grant us a second chance as a reason to presume on God's grace. You see, Jonah, in this extent, is actually unique among the prophets. This is the only time we find in the Old Testament a prophet really being given that second opportunity to render obedience after he has fled. This kind of thing is generally not the norm. God, as the sovereign Lord of the universe, expects to be obeyed. And so there is a tension that we need to be aware of. There is a tension here on the one hand between God's grace and God's command to us. And even when God is being gracious, that doesn't mean that we're not going to get a bit of vomit on us as we get spewed back up to resume our calling. Okay, and that's the end of the first part there. We've got any questions, any comments? We've got to work through a little bit. I've gone through, I guess, the first two chapters at least, and into the third part of the third chapter. Is there anything that people want to raise, want to talk about, want to question? I know we'll have a little bit of a chance to do this tomorrow as well. But I guess as we've been tracking along so far, is there anything that people have stood out? Is there any comments they want to make? Um, I'm quite happy, it's usual, that people don't actually ask questions, they actually use question times as a podium to come and make their own statements. If you want to do that, that's fine as well. I'm, I'm happy to work with, work with that as well. Yep. Yes, yep. Can you just talk to us about your take on chapter 2, the prayer? Yep. You've made a few comments about it, but it just seems such a rich uh, part of the theology of response to... Um, the situation of being in two of this, Yep, yep. Can you just... Okay. Um, okay. The prayer is interesting on a couple of levels. I'm just trying to actually get it open in front of me. And not least because of the amount that it resembles a lot of Psalms. And when we're working through this, um, this prayer, and you've got your eyes open to the Psalms, you realise how much of this language is actually either directly quoting from Psalms or at least evoking those themes and those languages and those ideas. Um, and so part of what I see in Jonah's experience is that, is that as he is going through this, he finds in the worship that he has experienced as encapsulated in the Psalms something to process and something to work through that challenge. And I, and I do wonder if, if there is a way in which the Psalms therefore could work in a similar or should work in a similar way to us as well. That in these periods of confinement, in these periods of challenge and despair, where does he go? Where does his mind go? It goes to the books of the book of 
psalms, and he finds that to be a source of a consolation, he finds that as a way of processing his experiences. And I wonder, therefore, that you know, when we encounter our times of, of, of trauma and despair and challenge, whether the psalms have got some of the resources there that we really need to be, to be I guess, working through and processing and helping us to, to kind of give voice to that experience and also to process it. Yeah. How did the book of Jonah work within the context of Israel's worship? What was its point? Uh, what was its, you know, you said the others did, you know, all the other prophets have a direct message to Israel. Yeah, yeah. This is almost a parable of sorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering what it does for Israel as a, as a people of God. Yeah. It's a really good question. Um, a lot of people, it's not so popular in contemporary scholarship, but they viewed it really as a, as a text that was written during the post-exilic period. And what we see happening during the post-exilic period is, in some senses, a narrowing within Judaism. Um, we see this particularly in um, some of the stuff that happens in Ezra and Nehemiah in terms of the reforms that they try to institute. One of the reforms is to build the wall around Jerusalem. Another one is to get rid of foreign wives. Um, and there's quite a, it's almost a heart-wrenching scene where the rain is pouring down, I think it's in Nehemiah, and they basically send away their foreign wives. Um, and, um, and so there seems to be in which there is a narrowing down, a kind of setting up a bunker mentality. In some extent, I guess it can be explainable on the, on the basis that they're very survival. Is it, is it threat? Uh, but there does seem to be that, that turning inward, that inward focus, and that's that wanting to create a distinct separation between themselves and, and the Gentile people. Um, and so it's often been argued, I'm not too sure how much I'm convinced by it, but that sense in which this book is, is especially as it goes on later, and it talks about God's got a message for the, um, the Ninevites, but more than that, God is concerned about the Ninevites. That maybe in some senses, in a post-exilic context, it's a gentle, perhaps not so much a gentle, a rebuke of a tendency to close down the hatches. This is actually to show that, well, actually, yes, God is concerned about you, but hey, you don't need to be limited just to you. God is concerned about creation as a whole. I mean, He's not only concerned about the Ninevites; He's actually concerned about the animals that I've got there as well. But there is that sense in which His concern transcends just them and His people. So it's, a, it's a, mm -hmm. an encouragement to, to break out of that narrow government mentality. It's a broadening. A broadening. Yeah. Aaron, I can recall, uh, recall a time in our movement when uh, a minister's understanding of the book of Jonah yeah. was used to determine whether they were a true evangelical yeah. or a raving liberal. Yeah. And I recall, I think your presentation just reminded me, I was on uh, deputation with the College of the Bible in a very remote part of Western Australia when we were asked this question. Yeah. And I remember the very that few foes to answer. <laughs> uh, which, uh, I'm not sure how he did that, that's what I remember. But, but like, what, why was, was that, um, just refresh my memory on why such a big issue was made about, yeah, yeah. Uh, like obviously in some theological circles it is regarded as just a story, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the way that I, the way I've, I've tried to approach it is, I don't know, it's probably about a lot of, a lot of things. I mean, I'm, I'm agnostic, I don't, personally, I, I'm quite happy for it to have happened historically, yeah. but I also, you know, I'm, I'm happy if, it, if it's a story, if it's a parable, because, um, yeah, to me, I guess it, it's got a message that transcends a particular historical context and a particular historical time. And there's a lot that we can learn about it. And there's a lot that I think we can learn. I think it teaches us a lot about God, about our relationships with each other, about the nature and vocation of ministry. And for some people, that's essential that it took place in, in a historical basis. And um, that's fine. For me, I, I, I'm comfortable if it did, or but I'm also comfortable if it didn't as well. Uh, Aaron, yeah. can I pick up? Uh, just a couple of things on second chance. Another one was yeah. uh, kind of uh, not not answering God's call or having choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They kind of go together. Uh, one of the things that I 
uh, have been thinking through with regards to uh, Peter and Jesus and also back to Jonah there is that in fact he, he did die in the belly of the whale and so then he was actually raised to new life and he was a he was a man raised from the dead who preached the Ninevite repentance yeah. the same as uh, Peter would become a prophet who would speak of Christ's death and resurrection for repentance of sins yeah. and Peter also had to die in order to do that and so it really doesn't mean you get a second chance but all of us actually need to die in order to become God's prophets and that's what he does to us through the yeah. gospel. Well certainly I mean when you're talking about in that Jonah 2 psalm he's using language which is evoking and talking about a Maybe not death, but certainly a near death experience. Yeah, you know, you spent three, three days in the belly of the whale and we talked about yeah. you know, the, the, like the death of Christ, really, wouldn't it? So, yeah. in that sense, he, he died in order to be God's prophet. Yeah. Which yeah. I would say, I mean, uh, firstly, that's what we kind of go through every week before Sunday. Yes. You vomit yeah. it out of the mouth of the whale and, yeah, yeah. and you speak God's word. That's, yeah. That seems to be how it is. Yeah, well, apparently there are some, some pulpits in, in Europe. Well, there's a few there. The world where you actually to preach, you have to go up through the belly of oh, the uh, okay. fish and it, they're carved out in the shape of a whale and you preach out of the mouth of the whale because that gospel ministry of praying and preparing is going through the belly of the whale. The, the other reason why I'm saying Has anyone got one of those in the church? church? <laughs> the other, the other, it's called my office door. The, uh, the other reason why I'd say that is what, what would happen to Jonah if he didn't go? I, I guess I was thinking about my own disobedience in life mm. and Jonah's, as, as, as you've picked up, yeah. is that when we rebel against God's call, we actually uh, cause danger and harm to other people, not only ourselves. Yeah. And I just wondered if God, <coughs> if Jonah didn't respond or however, he was actually chucked over into death, really, wasn't he, to die in motion. Um, which seems to be that if he whichever way you went, death was the way, yeah. do you know what I mean? Well I certainly think that you're right, when we're working against the call, there is the chance that we harm others, and the classic example of this is that when he gets on the boat it's not only his own life which yeah. is put in jeopardy, yeah. it's the ship it's, it's everyone who's else is, who's, who's in contact with, so it's the other sailors and it's the captain yeah. and it's So if they want to, it doesn't really seem like you have a choice Yeah As far as coming down to yeah, yeah. That would be my own experience too. Yeah, and certainly, I mean, he is pursued and pursued and pursued in a way that, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more when we come back. Um, he does go, you're right, yeah. but, I, but I'm still wondering in, in which it's a, an issue of conviction. You know, he goes because he has to, he doesn't, have, doesn't really have a choice. Anymore, but I'm not too sure how much he's actually changed and how much he desires to go. Seemed so, so like the, the uh, having died in the belly of the whale, that was the change. Change, yeah. Like that. And I think that's, that's how it is for us. So when we actually die with Christ through the gospel, yeah, yeah. that, that yeah. Us. The only qualifier I would put though is I'm not 100% convinced that he does actually go through this dramatic change in the belly of the whale. I, I do think that Jonah after isn't as different from Jonah before as we perhaps might. Yeah. Okay, I'll do maybe one more. We're going to have a time. Do two more. Do two more. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, Peterson says he was under the unfaithful mark. We never see an obedient Jonah. Jonah, yeah. Every, every step of the way is disobedient. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, 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 again, it depends on how you define obedient. He is obedient in the sense that he goes to Nineveh, where he wasn't going there beforehand. But I think when you start to ask about his motivations and the reasons for him going, I don't think that's necessarily changed. Um, he goes because he realises he can't flee anymore. He doesn't go because he necessarily realises that this is the thing that he should do. Yeah. Did I hear you say, in terms of God, the second chance, that Jonah was unique in the Old Testament? Uh, uh, yes, but you probably pick up on a way that, um, that he wasn't. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yep. an example of Moses and yep. David. Both of them, uh, you know, Moses killed the Egyptian, and I think we must see his ministry from that point of time on as being the second chance that God given him. Yeah, okay. Let me just. Um, okay. Um, I 
think he, I think if Jonah is unique, it is the way in which he is given a call, he rejects that, he goes his own way, tries to flee from it, um, but then is given the same call again and goes along with it that second time. I'm not sure, at least I can't think off the top of my head, and people can feel free to come and have a chat with me, that I'm not too sure if we see that exact dynamic working out elsewhere in terms of the Old Testament prophets. Again, though, people have I'm got... Sure. Suggestion. Yeah. 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 I appreciate your thoughts. I mean, in terms of Peter, I haven't made that sort of connection, yeah. but um, I would still think that he's not <coughs> in terms of Old Testament characters. Characters, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, as I said, we'll have a, a chance to kind of talk through this tomorrow. Maybe we can do a bit of looking tonight and see if we can come up with something. Okay. Okay, okay well, thank you for that. Um, and handing over to you now, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.